Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for that introduction, Kendall. And thank you so much, Thunder Plains team, for having me. I'm really excited. This is my second American conference, so I'm pretty excited, pretty nervous, but pretty excited. A um, couple things before we start. Um, at the bottom of this slide, you'll see a, a link, ramonh.dev slash dance dash mat dash js dot pdf. These are my slides in case you would like to follow along on a separate device or screen. Uh, quick content warning, I will be playing a couple of sounds and music, so please be aware. Um, I tried to tweak the audio, so hopefully it won't surprise you too much. Um, at the bottom of my slides, you'll see some subtitles. Um, these are for folks in, to be able to follow along. Uh, if you're curious, by the way, these are provided by um, Google uh, by Google Slides, and I believe PowerPoint does this as well, FYI. <laughs> so uh, yeah, as Kendall very kindly introduced, my name is Ramon. Um, don't worry about rolling the R. Ramon is totally fine. Uh, um, I'm from Chile, but I live in Austria. I've been living here for 20 years. It's been quite a while. Um, and for 10 of those years, I've been working as a freelance software contractor. Um, doing. I like to call myself a, a bit of a generalist or an everything developer. I like to bob here and in and out of things like the back end, the front end, native, Mac OS, um, doing lots of Ruby, lots of JavaScript, and more recently, some Rust, which be, has been a lot of fun. As I also mentioned, I'm doing lots of community stuff. I think community keeps us going as software developers. It empowers us. It enables us to learn. We learn from each other by teaching. We teach from each other by learning. <laughs> we just I think it's so powerful to be able to do this. And events like this are so important for us to be able to be to inspire one another and keep going. For two of the last uh, few years, I've been uh, a, a member of something called the Mozilla Tech Speakers Group, which is a community of really motivated people who talk about uh, the open web. Sadly, that group is a little bit more unofficial now, given some changes on Mozilla, but we're still around, we're still talking for each other, and it's just one of my favorite experiences. In the past, I've also been doing some coding instruction for kids. That taught me so much. I've got another talk if you're interested sometime. Uh, I've also been a football coach. That's, uh, sorry, European football, not so uh, so soccer. Um, and all of these different experiences just make me who I am today. Now, if you've been to my Twitter, you might have seen, or my website, you might have seen a picture of me with a dog. You might have been wondering, uh, that's enough about you, Ramon. Can we see more of the dog, please? And I'm like, yes, of course you can. This is Fiona. Uh, she is the love of my life. I love her so much. And she's got these eyes that I just can't get enough of. My favorite picture of her is this one at the top right where she's judging my wife as she eats some mango. I love it. So <laughs> let's go to the talk, huh? Um, let's talk about dancing games in particular, dancing video games. Now, some of you might recognize this game here. This is Just Dance. Um, for the last 15 or so years, it's been pretty popular with, uh, with gamers. More recently, there's been a game called Beat Saber, which is a VR experience where you slash these cubes with your two swords to the beat. I've only gotten to try this game a couple times, but it's a lot of fun. But today, I want to talk to you about a significantly older game from my teenage years. It's called Dance Dance Revolution, or as I'll refer to it from now on, DDR. And as this kind GIF is helping me to explain, you've got a mat on the floor with some buttons on it. And what you do is you press, push those buttons with your feet to the beat, uh, to the rhythm. And that kind of makes it look like you're dancing. Well, how does this game look like on screen? This is what it looks like. <laughs> this is a screenshot from the original DDR on PlayStation, circa 1997, 98, uh, at least when I played it. And uh, <laughs> the graphics are a little blockier than I remember, but that's nostalgia for you. Uh, the way it works is you've got these arrows that are moving up. And what you need to do is push those arrows on the floor to the rhythm. And somehow it makes it look like you're dancing. So that's what the game looks like. You might be wondering, what about the music? <sighs> the music is quite a chunk of nostalgia, let me tell you. I'm going to play you a little piece. It's got this unmistakable late 90s, early 2000s Euro beat rhythms. It's fantastic. I'm going to play you a little sample. It's great. And <laughs> if you know it, you know it. I love this game so much. So 
more recently, I wanted to play this game with my wife. I wanted to introduce her to the game. Uh, and we were having a pretty hard time finding a used copy of the old game. They don't, they don't make a lot of DDRs that are widely distributed in Europe anymore. However, we found an open source solution. And this solution is called Step Mania. Now, what you're looking at here is a screenshot of Step Mania on action. And you might, you might think, yeah, this looks pretty similar to DDR. And you'd be right. So this runs on most platforms, PC, Mac OS, I believe Linux as well. <laughs> fun, fun fact about Step Mania. When I gave this talk at uh, JS Conf, uh, when JavaScript Bangkok earlier this year in February, uh, back when I could still travel, I actually met a, someone who was used to be a, a maintainer of this program. He was, and they were a, a, an organizer of the conference. Amazing how these things work. So the way you play this at home is you've got this step mania and you need a controller. Now a controller will look like this. This is a foam mat, uh, which means the, 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 you know, it's kind of like a soft squishy material that you can step on and the buttons work by contacts. Uh, and these aren't too expensive uh, here in Europe. They were costing about 30 euros or 28, $27 if my exchange is correct. Um, and they were pretty great. Uh, we could plug them in. This one's for PlayStation, but they also work on, they, you've also got ones for PC and other consoles. I've still got my GameCube one. And the great thing about these is that, like I said, they're affordable. But the bad thing is, after a lot of time and a lot of use, the contacts tend to wear out. So pretty much after a some time, you'll start running into this screen a lot. <laughs> but there are alternatives. We were looking at metallic mats. And these you can find online as well. And they're produced to this day. Excuse me. They're produced to this day. However, they are pretty expensive. <laughs> Here's a screenshot I took a few years ago where you could buy two mats. And you might be thinking, wow, two mats for $339? That's a lot of money. Now, what you might be missing is if you just look above that, the regular price is discounted from $919. That's a lot of bones for a dance mat. And well, we didn't have the money at the time to justify it. So we kind of abandoned the idea for a while. And some time later, we attended some uh, an event here in Vienna called Maker Fair, which if I'm not mistaken, takes place around the world. So you might have a Maker Fair near you too. Um, it's a, if you don't know it, it's a lot of event. Please pardon the German in the <laughs> screenshot. What it is is an event where people can come in and show off their stuff, um, sh show off their products, their projects. Uh, you can pick up um, pieces of hardware or attend workshops. It's a lot of fun. And there I was introduced to a company and their product called Bear Conductive. Now, Bear Conductive are a British company that produce... Um, what they call pair conductive paint. And you might have seen this before. It's an electronic paint that lets you draw circuits, which is pretty cool. They had a demo on Facebook or YouTube or something where you could show off um, where you could show off your uh, where they would show off their their uh, a battery being painted to a light bulb and a light bulb going back to the battery, and it would work. The way it would work is that 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 paint carries a charge, which is pretty cool. The problem is, um, the problem is it's pretty, it's not that expensive, but it's not something you want to throw around. <laughs> but when I saw them there at Maker Fair, I didn't realize something. That paint is also capacitative, which means that if you touch it, the electricity from your body induces a charge on the paint and it can introduce a charge and be received by a device. What you're looking at here is some bare conductive paint being painted towards a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is then connected to what they call a Pi Cap. And this Pi Cap has a series of electrodes that you can see that each of them identifies a different contact. So when you touch one of these contacts, this device here would play a piano tune. So when I looked at this and I kind of went, hmm. Giving, I, I decided looking at this device, to check out what else was possible. Now, what you're looking at here is a screenshot from GitHub. 
this is the PyCap SDK for their uh, for JavaScript that they have for Node.js. And at the bottom, they had a little piece of sample code that I could essentially copy paste and try out. And I could code and script my own device with this paint, which then got me thinking, hmm. <laughs> I thought, wow, I could definitely make something with this. So then I went back to Stepmania just to confirm that my theory. Now, Stepmania allows you to customize it, you know, being pretty customizable in open source, I, those things tend to go hand in hand, right? So I could set my own keys and uh, inputs for operating the game. So then I thought, okay, my wife and I looked at this and we said, okay, what if, hear me out, we take a yoga mat, we take one of these pie caps, we take a Raspberry Pi Zero, we take some bare conductive paint, we take a little bit of Node.js and make our own dance mat. Well, folks, that's kind of how Project Dance Mat JS was born. <laughs> so this is on GitHub. It works and it's there for people to try. Now, before I go into the nitty gritty of how this works, uh, if you're not familiar with it, the Raspberry Pi um, is a tiny computer. Um, the one we were using is called the Raspberry Pi Zero W which uh, is really small, about this big. You're going to see it in a bit um, here live. Uh, it's a tiny computer. It costs about 10 pounds, uh, 10 British pounds. Uh, and it runs on, it runs any flavor, uh, sorry, it runs Linux and is a piece of hardware that you can customize. So full disclosure, when, I, when we started this project a few years ago, I had to t be honest with myself and say, well, this is my first ever hardware project. Things were going to be a little bit tricky. <laughs> but OK, I was up for the challenge, and we were kind of motivating each other. So we got going. So here's the plan. We've got our dance mat. We connect it to the computer. And the computer says, aha, this is a keyboard I'm interacting with. I'll treat it as such. Now, I'm going to show you a larger version of that code that we were using. What we're doing is essentially uh, importing this, this SDK setting a touch and release threshold. So to explain that, the way this capacitative stuff works is you, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's not quite when you touch it that it, it reacts, but rather when electricity starts traveling from your body to the paint. So there is a bit of resistance there, and there's a bit of also air travel. So you got to tweak it a little bit. We'll get to that later. <laughs> um, and then what we have is some touch processing. Um, so when you start up the script, the device will start processing data from these electrodes that I mentioned earlier and do this in a loop. Now, you might see a comment in there that says, send data to PC. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but it turned out to be quite a bit of work. So that's what I aim to share with you today. Now, how did we connect it to the computer? So thing about the Raspberry Pi Zero W is that um, the W implies that it's wireless, right? So it's got a Wi-Fi connection that we could leverage. But I thought, hey, why not use Bluetooth? See, this thing also has Bluetooth embedded. So I thought, that'll be fun. Um, I have I had never tried coding Bluetooth pairing before. It turned out to be a little bit more than I was ready for. <laughs> but uh, it also turned out to be really, really laggy. So we decided in the end, you see, you might notice this device has two US, mini USB ports. Um, we'll get into those later, but we can use USB to do that. So think about US, those USB ports. From left to right, one is a data USB port, and the other one's a power USB port. What this means is that the Raspberry Pi uses the rightmost USB port for power, as I mentioned, and the leftmost one for sending data via USB. Now, just because <laughs> you can plug a device, a, a Raspberry Pi via USB to a computer, does not mean that my computer will immediately say, "Aha! Well, this is a computer. This is a keyboard I'm dealing with. Of course, I'll treat it as such." And I didn't think of this going in. And you might be wondering, Ramon, how did you not think of this? Clearly, a Raspberry Pi is not a keyboard. May I remind you, this is my first time doing something like this. 
but I immediately hit the internet and some communities out there for hardware hacking. And I found that the Raspberry Pi actually allows itself to be customized, to be um, transformed into what is called a USB gadget. So there are some uh, built-in mechanisms in the Raspberry Pi flavor of Linux, also no previously known as Raspbian, now known as Raspberry Pi OS. And there, like I said, these are some functionalities that we can enable in order for the computer to treat the USB, the Raspberry Pi as a USB gadget. Now that sounds like a lot. And I was able with this blog post, with the help of this blog post to get up and running very quickly. Now the content of this blog post comes in two parts that I was able to take out. Number one, enabling Raspberry Pi OTG mode or USB on the go mode. Second is, uh, adding a boot script to enable keyboard USB HID or human interface device uh, on the config FS, which stands for file system. We'll get into that in a moment. So just to, to go over it again, this, this Raspberry Pi has two USB ports. Now, if I configure this to be a gadget for USB on the go, then if I plug it, the Raspberry Pi via the USB port into my computer, then I won't need any power. The computer will, pa will power the Raspberry Pi via this Raspberry Pi OTG mode. Um, this turned out to be a couple of commands that I needed to put into the Raspberry Pi's config FS. Uh, sorry, not the config FS, just into the Raspberry Pi's configuration. A couple of pre-built files, that, the pre-built functionalities and kernel extensions that I was able to enable. <laughs> um, once I've done this, I've enabled OTG mode. Next is a boot script to enable keyboard HID compatibility on the config file system. Now, this looks like a lot. And believe me, it is. <laughs> this It's so big that it actually goes off the screen on my slides here. Nice, nice going, me. <laughs> well, um, there's three parts away that I was able to take away with it from this that I found a lot of fun, which is this part here. You see, when you plug a USB device into a computer, you might notice sometimes installing such and such device from such and such manufacturer. So of course, I changed the product to be DDR Dance Mat and the manufacturer to be yours truly. And I gave it some random serial number. Now, once I did that on the Raspberry Pi and then plugged it in via USB directly, I was able to hear a sound on my computer. And let me tell you, this sound, I had never been so happy to hear this sound in my life before. And the sound went something like this. <laughs> it was being recognized as a USB keyboard. Now, what's ConfigFS? The thing about ConfigFS is that it's a virtual file system mounted on the Raspberry Pi and on Linux devices in general. Linux and file systems is actually something pretty magical that I haven't learned a lot about before. So this was a really cool opportunity for me to get into how this works. There's a lot of configuration. See, this should be Raspberry Pi OS now. Uh, there's a lot of configuration that's possible on these devices. And I am learning so much. I was really happy with this progress that we were making. So next up was learning how to communicate via this USB interface, or as it's known, the Human Interface Devices Information. So this is their website for USB. I didn't know there was a website before. Um, there is a PDF with a manual you can download. It's a couple hundred pages long, and I've tried reading it. And <laughs> after some time, I make that sound, you know, like, you know, basset hounds, right? Those big dogs. Um, that sound they make when they try to bark, I go with something like, oof. <laughs> I got pretty exhausted. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna reach out for help. I'm not the best at helping, uh, asking for help, but I try to bear in mind, I love it when people ask me for help with things. Why wouldn't it be okay for other people who of course are available and willing and able to help me, to help me? And there are communities out there that do this, that, that dedicate themselves to, to helping out those in need. So I learned that a keystroke, when you press a key, on your computer, what uh, on your keyboard, what you're doing is sending a keystroke by a USB, and by doing so via USB is communicated, as said here, by a byte array of eight keys, and each of these keys is rec uh, is represented by a hexadecimal number. Uh, <laughs> I did eventually find a list of these on GitHub, super handy. So, for example, uh, the hexadecimal number four represents the letter A. 
B is represented by five, C is six, and so on and so forth. So I was able to take these and integrate them into my JavaScript. Player one left is A, player one right is up, uh, B, player one up is C, and player one down is D. So when I press these buttons on my dance mat, my objective is for the computer to recognize it as a keyboard typing in A, B, C, and D, respectively. I was already delighted from, my, from our progress. So once we did that, I was able to start processing this data. Now, the, every time, every, every uh, callback of this running loop on the, on the PyCap itself, I'm sending, it's being sent a chunk of data. And what this data is, is uh, a representation of which of the electrodes have been uh, given a charge, right? So to, just as a reminder, at the bottom right here, this is what the pie cap looks like. And along the top, you'll see there's 12 electrodes. So once I, when I press one, at one of these, all I have to do is check, OK, what's the, what's, which number does this represent if it is touched? So loop over all of the electrodes that have been touched, right? Uh, sorry, all of the electrodes. If it if this electrode is touched, then depending on which symbol it represents, it uh, sorry, which index it has, I then send that key press, right? So I just create an array of uh, keys being pressed at a given time. Once I do that, I'm just gonna take that data, those keys, and turn them into an array of eight, because as I mentioned before, a keystroke is represented by eight hexadecimal symbols. Now, I when I do that, I first need to prepend two, uh, two symbols. You see, in a keystroke, the first two are used for modifiers. Modifiers, in this case, are keys like Shift, Control, Alt. I don't know if caps lock counts. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, and just to be on the safe side, in case I'm pressing all 12 electrodes at the same time, I'm going to trim off the last four, uh, the last couple one to ensure that I can press at most six, right? Now, in DDR, it is possible to press more than two keys at the same time. In fact, it is sometimes required. Sometimes buttons come in pairs and you do this cool jumpy maneuver. I'm not going to jump too much because it's kind of loud, <laughs> um, right? So I create my array of eight hexadecimal symbols. Once I do that, I can actually test this and see that I'm producing an array of eight hexadecimal symbols. Now, I need to convert those symbols into a byte array. And this turned out to be pretty straightforward thanks to Mozilla Developer Network's uh, great documentation. They have a, JavaScript has a function called uint8 array. And all I had to do was take my array and turn that into a, a buffer. So call uint8 array from keystroke, turn that into a buffer. And now to send the keystroke via USB from the Raspberry Pi into the computer. So quick reminder, we're running Linux here. So in Linux and Unix systems, there's that whole, there's that old adage, right? Uh, adage, not adage. Uh, everything's a file, right? So I could use file descriptors, right? Turns out I could. If you're not familiar with file descriptors, file descriptors represent all, all matters of input and output parts of a file system. So uh, a, a file dis in, in Linux, a file descriptor represents a keyboard. It represents another computer, uh, a, a network device. It represents a file. Um, and you can communicate with these. For example, if you want to send data to a printer, it is totally possible to pipe data from from Linux into a file that represents that printer, and then that printer will, bzzz, will print out some stuff. Now, when I ran that script on boot to tell my computer that, hey, I'm a I'm a keyboard, it mounted on configfs. Uh, it mounted, sorry, it mounted an input output file with the following name, which I called Hijo. So we're gonna call it Hijo from now on, <laughs> not Hijo. Thanks to subtitles. Uh, Hijo. So it is totally possible to just pipe data, like I said, blah, blah, blah. I am a keystroke and pipe that into Hijo. Now, I mean, with Node.js, I can write data to files. 
Why can't I do that? And I did some searching around. I wanted to make sure I was doing this right. And wouldn't you know it, NPM never stops surprising me what people make. It's such an incredible community out there of what people do and are capable of. So there exists an NPM package for writing stuff to Linux devices. <laughs> it's called uh -huh, Linux device. So what this does is it allows me to say, hey, I've got a device. The file is at Hijo, um, and I can write to it with this. Uh, I forget what the 16 represents. I think it's something like the, 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 the size of kilobytes or something like that. I got to look. I'll, I'll follow up with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, and once I do that, all I have to do in order to write data is to just device.write and send it that byte array. Now, I'm not done yet. See, when you open a file, you got to be a good citizen. When you close the program, you got to close the file. So, <laughs> got to clean up. So, once you do that, you're left with nothing but testing. So, we load up the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I use a pro, I use the uh, Linux has a functionality uh, called RC local that lets me tell run a couple of scripts when the device boots up. So I can tell it to, hey, run node dance mat JS. And once I did that, I thought, well, how do I test this? How do I test this? Oh, I know. It's a keyboard, right? So <laughs> let's just open up a text editor and test it there. And wouldn't you know it, there it is running in all its typing glory. This was super exciting. And you might be wondering, how did you test this on the device? Uh, how did you debug this? How did you run this on the, you know, make quick changes? Did you have to like copy with SCP or something, secure copy? Um, yes and no. I mean, it is a Raspberry Pi. It is running Linux. So I could just SSH into the Raspberry Pi, make my changes and rerun the code whenever I liked. It was kind of weird and awesome <laughs> at the same time. Now that's the tech part. What about the painting part? You're, and you'd be right. Now is the part where we do the painting. So uh, you might be wondering, you said something about a yoga mat. Is that still on the cards? Absolutely. Here's a picture of us painting it several years ago. Excuse me. Heck, we didn't even, we, you know, there's 12 electrodes on this thing. That's one player. Let's have two. <laughs> um, word of advice, if you ever do this project, do not paint two dance mats so close to each other or you will bump into each other when playing. <laughs> um, here, so we cut it in half. And here it is running. Uh, you see a start button. You see the up, down, left, and right buttons. And you might be wondering, did it work? Yes. Uh, were you still good at DDR after all those years? Not really. <laughs> um, but it worked. And that was so exciting. You might be wondering, OK, so you've done that. Are we set? For, are you, are we set for life now? And honestly, depends how you look at it. Um, let me just uh, zoom in. Uh, computer, enhance, please. Thank you. Uh, what you're seeing here is a zoomed in uh, version of the dance mat. It's a zoomed in picture of the dance mat. And what's happening here is that over time, the paint started to crack. It dried up. It started to crack. It's a bit of a combination of doing it on a dance uh, on a yoga mat. You know, it tends to absorb a little bit of the paint. So we were finding little problems here and there that we started compiling a list called the if we could do it all over again list. First off being, so when I introduced this project to people around me on the internet, they're like, oh, Ramon, you, you overcomplicated it so much. Why didn't you use Arduino? And I'm like, that's a fantastic question. Uh, quick follow-up question, what is Arduino? <laughs> I didn't know at the time. Uh, what it is, it's a it's a microcontroller um, similar to Raspberry Pi, but it's more uh, bare bare metal and doesn't run an OS, and allows you to do um, similar kind of projects. In fact, there's another project that I was introduced to called Makey Makey, which uh, allows you to connect things via elect by electrodes, very similar to how we did it here, um, but you know out of the box. Um, another thing we can improve is, as I mentioned, in a smoother surface, something like paper. Maybe there's a reason why the paper is used. <laughs> um, and the cables, let, let me just go back to this slide here. You'll notice that we connect the Raspberry Pi. I hope you can all see my cursor. Um, we connect to the Raspberry Pi via these little cables that we painted. 
And that wasn't ideal. So in the end, we, en we opted for using physical cables or um, that we soldered on, soldered, soldered, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that word, <laughs> that we soldered onto the Raspberry Pi Pi cap. So it was messy. It was a lot of fun. But the important thing is we learned so much from this project. We were delighted. Here's a picture of us being super happy going out for a celebratory dinner back when we could. So you might be wondering, OK, that's nice and all, Ramon, but does it work? Do you want to show it to us? And I'm like, well, yes, of course. Before I do that, I want to show you some of the demo prototypes that I've been through. Uh, this is, I don't know what to call it, Mark 1, Mac 1, I don't know. <laughs> Failure. I call it failure. <laughs> I was supposed to introduce this at Half Stack Vienna 2019 last year, and it ended up in disaster because, as I mentioned before, I was using paint cables to connect to the Raspberry Pi, and I just sort of taped it on with washi tape. And it kind of happened that I was trying to test it, and it came loose, and I tried to fix it, and then it kind of spread to other electrodes. And then I tried to fix it with some water, and the water kind of made it worse. It was a disaster. So what I'm about to show you now is what I call the demo version. <laughs> what I'm using here are crocodile clips. I hope they're called that in the Americas as well. Um, you know, little chompy clips that you attach to the different paints. And the start button is this cute little cat that my sister uh, painted for us. And that's what I'm about to show you right now. So first off, we need Step Mania. So let's bring that up. I apologize. It's in Spanish, but jugar means play. Next, what I'm going to do is move my camera so that instead of looking at me, and I hope this doesn't end in disaster, apologies to the tech folks at Thunder Plains. Um, let's hang this up here. Welcome to my mess. So what you see here, hopefully well, is the Raspberry Pi over here, and the dance mat demo unit. Let me just make sure that nothing's blocking it. I think my microphone is blocking it a little. There we go. All right, so let's play some Step Mania. Hit the start button. Hey. All right. So in Step Mania, you pick a song, pick a difficulty, and get started. Hope it's not too loud. So, quick demo. P.S. I'm terrible at doing this with my hands. So you see, it's being treated as a keyboard. And I can press two keys at once. It's really hard not to dance with my body as I do this. And there we see all four directions are being recognized. There we go. I'm actually doing a lot better than I usually do when I'm doing this live. Almost at the end. I think I lost, folks. I'm sorry. There you have it. Yep, that's a game over. <laughs> well, not too terrible for doing it live, I suppose. At least it works. So. <laughs> I just got some applause from the Thunder Plains tech. Um, thank you. Uh, all right. So let's go back to our talk. Um, thank you for letting me play live for you. Now, in case you want to have a little laugh, this demo unit you're, you, we're looking at here, 
you might be thinking, is that cardboard? Yes, it is. What is it made of? It's a pizza box. Computer flip, please. Thank you. <laughs> now, that's what's cool about this project is, or any kind of hardware project. You can really think out. Uh, I'm sorry to use a pun. You can really think outside the box. <laughs> um, and I just, what I'm hoping to do with this talk is to really inspire those of you who maybe tried hardware hacking in the fa in the past and maybe were a little daunted, but I found it a little daunting. Um, you know, I worked on this project with the support of my wife, with the support of uh, our local study group here in Vienna that we run, uh, our coding study group, that is. And there's just a ton of support out there. It reminded me of how important it is to just play around with the technology. I could leverage the technology knowledge that I have from doing web development into, and Linux, of course, into a device that I was less familiar with. There's so many packages out there and there's so many kind folks doing endless work to make sure that your projects can thrive. And well, folks, if you have a fun idea, just go for it. You never know, it'll be awesome. So that's me, folks. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to get in touch, show me what you've done, or you know, bounce ideas together for fun idea for fun hardware stuff. You know, hit me up on Twitter. I'm Hola Soy Milk. It's a terrible joke that means Hello, I am Milk in Spanish. Um, thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of Thunder Plains. <laughs>